So when the great Fred Bolitnikov was released by the Raiders, or what he called uh, boycotted or severed ties uh, in the end of the 1978 season, he ended up in the CFL with my Montreal Alouettes for a year, was a good uh, possession receiver for the squad. Literally could have still played the NFL, but I we were wondering why he was let go. Now, rumors built uh, soon after that his participation in a Hollywood movie may have uh, how do you say, cause his exit from the Raiders in the NFL. He trained Nick Nolte to play the key character in this uh, Dallas Cowboy-style motivated football comedy drama. <coughs> of course, we're talking about North Dallas 40. Now, this 1979 box office hit uh, starred Nolte, the Mac Davis, the singer and songwriter, kind of playing a Craig Morton, Don Meredith style, and G.D. Spradlin said it a decadent word of a world of American pro football in the late 1970s. It was directed by Ted Kochoff and based on the best-selling 73 novel by former cowboy Peter Gent. The screenplay was by Kochoff, Gent, Frank Yablins, and Nancy Dowd, who was uncredited. This was the first film role for Mac Davis, a popular country music recording artist who also wrote for Elvis. Now in this one, in the late 1950s, Phil Elliott playing Nick Nolte playing really Fred Bolitkoff uh, is a uh, talented wide receiver for the North Dallas Bulls pro football team based in Dallas, which closely resembles the Dallas Cowboys. And there was a little bit of uh, what he call L.A., Oakland, uh, Las Vegas Raiders in it. Now, although considered to possess the best hands in the game, the agent Elliott has been benched and relies heavily on painkillers and uh, the training staff to get him through contests. His knees are shot, his shoulders are shot, and his confidence is shot. Elliott and popular quarterback Seth Maxwell are outstanding players, but they characterize the drug, sex, and alcohol-fueled party atmosphere of that era, especially in the Cowboys and the NFC squads. Elliott wants only to play the game, retire, and live on a horse farm with his girlfriend Charlotte, an aspiring writer who appears to be financially independent due to a trust fund from a wealthy family and has no interest whatsoever in football. Now, the Bulls play for iconic coach Strother, kind of a Tom Landry style who turns a blind eye to anything that his players may be doing off the field or anything that his assistant coaches and trainers condone to keep those players in the game, including the injections, pills, whatever. The coaches focus on players' tendencies, a quantitative measurement of their performance or analytics, as we call it in 2023, and seems less concerned about the human aspect of the game and the players. One player, Shattuck, finally erupts to assistant coach Johnson. Every time I call it a game, you call it a business. And every time I call it a business, you call it a game. The coach has manipulated Elliott to convince a younger age and a rookie on the team to start using painkillers and shots. Now, Elliott's nonconformist attitude encouraged the coach rat more than often. Uh, and at one point, the coach informs Elliott that his continuing attitude could affect his future career with the Bulls. In the final game of the season, he catches a touchdown pass with no time left in the clock to get North Dallas to win a one point of division rival Chicago, but the Bulls lose the game due to a mishandled snap on the extra point attempt and uh, kind of presaging Tony Romo uh, again in the contest, uh, the playoff loss to uh, Seattle. Now, in a meeting with team orders and coach Strother, Elliot learns that a Dallas detective has been hired by the Bulls to follow him. They reveal proof of his marijuana use and a sexual relationship with a woman named Joanne, who intends to marry team executive Emmett Hunter, the brother of owner Conrad Hunter. It is loosely implied that Emmett might be gay, and this is why she was sent. To, she went to Elliot for her sexual needs. Although the detective witnessed quarterback Seth Mat- Mat- Maxwell engaging in similar behavior, he pretends not to have recognized him. They tell Elliot that he's to be suspended without pay pending a league hearing, and Elliot convinced that the entire investigation is merely a pretext to allow the team to save money on his contract, quits the squad, telling the Hunter brothers that he does not need their money that bad. As he's leaving the team's headquarters in downtown Dallas, Elliot runs into Maxwell, who seems to have been waiting for him. Elliot informs him that he quit, prompting Maxwell to ask if his name came up in the meeting. Elliot deduces that Maxwell knew about the investigation the entire time. As Elliot walks away, Maxwell briefly reminisces about their time together on and off the football field, Maxwell prompts Elliot to turn around and throws a football to him, but Elliot lets it hit him in the chest and fall incomplete as he shrugs and throws his arm out to his sides, signifying that he truly is done with the game. And this was what I call a static shot at the end. Now, the Maxwell character is more Ken Stabler than Don Meredith, 
So, and some of the supporting characters are acting kind of like the crazy raiders of the 70s and 80s. And it has a good uh, supporting cast. Charles Durning is in it, uh, Bo Svensson, John Mutuzak, of course. Steve Force, who is kind of underused. Of course, G.D. Spradlin uh, playing, the, uh, playing the Tom Landry uh, head coach. Dabney Coleman in a very slimy performance. And, of course, the beautiful Savannah Smith-Boucher. Uh, now, what uh, a lot of people uh, saw this movie as sort of Paramount's attempt to take advantage of the popularity of the NFL and CFL at the time. In the late 1970s, the NFL and the CFL was at its highest level. You had the Pittsburgh-Dallas uh, situation in the NFL. You had the Alouettes, Eskimos, and the CFL. Uh, the Raiders were strong. The Colts, the, the Chargers, the, uh, the Giants, the NFL, NFC East was strong. And it did show in the box office. Almost two hours, and that, that's long for a sports movie. We made $20.61 million at the uh, box office. And this was uh, kind of one of the, the first big hits in the drama and comedy satire group. Now, it's widely considered by many people to be a classic sports film, giving insights into lives of pro athletes. If you ever uh, read the Peter Gant's book this is based upon, it's quite, it's quite interesting because the, the Cowboys from uh, mid-1960s up until that year, you had, again, the Dwayne Thomas situation, the Sphinx, who allegedly was on uh, drugs and uh, decided to go silent for a full year before they won the Super Bowl. You had the, uh, the Christian aspect of the team with Staubach and Lilly. You had Craig Morton, Don Meredith. You had uh, the big receiving cores. You had the former Olympian, Bob Hayes. There was a lot of, lot of stuff going on uh, with the team. But like I said, drug use and promiscuity and alleged bisexuality were hanging around uh, the Cowboys uh, for many years like rumors, and you see it in the movie if you read between the lines. Now, the CB autobiographical novel by Peter Gent who was a, a kind of a marginal Cowboys wide receiver in the late 60s, the film's characters closely resemble team members of that era. Seth Maxwell often compared to quarterback Don Meredith, but again uh, to, uh, to Ken Stabler as well, B.A. Strother to uh, Tom Landry, and Elliot to Gent, and of course Blitnikoff. Of the story, Meredith said, if I'd known Gent was as good as he says he was, I would have thrown into him more. Now, uh, the critical reception was quite interesting. It opened to good reviews. I saw it at the uh, Capitol Theater in the House in New Brunswick. It was a packed house. But uh, word of mouth kind of went away because unlike a hockey movie, it didn't get repeat business. A lot of people went to see it in the first couple of weeks. But at the time, Mac Davis was a lot more popular than Nick Nolte. Nick Nolte was okay in Rich Man, Poor Man. But as a lead actor, was still this was before 48 Hours. Now, some critics called it also the best film Ted Ted. Kochkov made behind Fun with Dick and Jane, an apprentice of Dirty Kravitz. In her review for the New York Times, Janet Maisel wrote the central friendship in the movie, beautifully delineated, is one between Nolte and Davis, who actually plays the team's quarterback, a man whose calculated nature and complacency make him all the more likable somehow. Time magazine Richard Schinkel wrote North Dallas 40, retains enough of the original novel's authenticity to deliver strong and brutish entertainment. Newsweek magazine, David Anson wrote the writers, Kochkoff, Gent, and producer uh, Yablans are nonetheless to be congratulated for allowing their story to live through its characters, uh, adju abjuring Rocky-like fantasy configurations for the hard realities of the game. North Dallas 40 isn't subtle or finely tuned, but it's, a, it's a, like a crunching downfield tackle. It leaves its mark. However, the Globe and Mail hated the movie. Rich Grohn, who was writing for him at the time, North Dallas 40 descends into the farce and into the lone man versus the corrupt system mentality uh, deprived of real residence. It's still not the honest portrait, portrait of pro athletes that sport buffs have been waiting for. SI Magazine's Frank DeFord wrote, <coughs> If North Dallas 40 is reasonably accurate, the pro game is a gruesome human abattoir, worse even than previously imagined. Much of the strength of this impression can be attributed to Nick Nolte. Unfortunately, Nolte's character, Elliot, is often fuzzingly drawn, which makes the actor's accomplishment all the more impressive. In his review for The Post in Washington, Gary Arnold wrote Charlotte, who seemed a creature of rhetorical fancy in the movie, still remains a trifle remote and uh, unassimilated. Dale Hayden may also be a little too prim and standoffish to achieve a satisfying romantic chemistry with Nolte. Somehow the temperaments don't mesh. Now, as of September 2023, 
NDF holds a rating of 84% based on 25 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. The site's uh, critical consensus states, muddled overall, but perceptive and brutally realistic. North Dallas 40 also benefits from strong performances by Nolte and Durning. Football fans would likely find it fascinating. But it was a movie of its time because it was topical at the time. Again, you had an NFL at the time was growing in popularity amongst the female audience. People were recognizing the players more, not just the quarterbacks, but the wide receivers. And because you had the strength of the Raiders, the Cowboys, the Steelers, the Montreal Alouettes, which were huge in Canada, which also led to more people internationally uh, trying to play in the CFL or watching the CFL. And, you know, war, that was the, the time when War Moon was rising. You had, uh, you know, Mervyn Fernandez in BC. You know, you had uh, Montreal, all the superstars that were playing with them from 78 onwards. Eh? Now, it grossed $2.8 in its opening weekend. The following weekend saw the weekend gross increase to $2.9 million. After 32 days from 654 theaters, it had grossed nearly $20 million and went on to gross $26 million in the States and Canada. Now, the NFL didn't take kindly to those who participated in the making of the movie. Hall of Famer Tom Fears, who advised on the movie's football action, had scouting contracts with three NFL teams, which all three were canceled after the film opened. Reporter Jane Levy and Tony Kornheiser in a September 6, 79 Washington Post article. And the Raiders, again, severed ties with Bliknikov, who coached Nolte. Freddie was even asked back to camp, writes Ghent. Tommy Riemann, who played uh, Delma, was cut by the 49ers after the film came out and said he had been blackballed, which is totally bizarre. He was a black character that almost had his head taken off after his hamstring industry was lessened by a shot. Now, the movie highlights the relationship between the violent world of pro football with the violence inherent in social structures and cultural mores of the late 60s American life, using a, cyber, uh, using a version of America's team in the most popular sport in the States as a metaphorical central focus. Recurring scenes of television and radio news reporting violent crimes, war, and environmental destruction are scattered throughout various scenes, but left out in the same scenes recreated in the movie. Throughout the novel, there is more graphic sex and violence, as well as drug and alcohol abuse when at the comic overtones of the film. For instance, the harassment of an unwilling girl in the party that's played for laughs in the movie is a brutal near rape and an orgy in a novel. Now, we ended the book. There's a shocking twist ending which Phil returns to Charlotte to tell her she has left football and to presumably continue, continue his relationship with her on her rants, but finds that she and a black friend, David Clark, who's not in the movie, have been regular lovers, unknown to Phil, Phil, and they have been violently murdered. The murder of Charlotte's ex-boyfriend and full football groupie Bobby Boudreau, who was also not in the movie. Boudreau has been stalking her throughout the novel. In the novel, Charlotte was a widow whose husband was an army officer who had been killed in Vietnam. Charlotte had told Phil that her husband had decided to resign his commission, but he had been killed in action while the crest was being processed. Now, I know a lot of background of the Dallas Cowboys and, uh, you know, the history through the years. There have been numerous books. But what really stood out for me, there was aspects of the Raiders, there was aspects of the Montreal Alouettes, there was aspects of the Cowboys, not as much with the Steelers, and i tell you why. This was a predominantly white team. There was one or two uh, black players and people of color. I think it was either a Simone or Aboriginal uh, uh, player that was feuding with Svensson. But you, you got to understand, ladies and gentlemen, this was a different time. Uh, promiscuous sex, drugs, or whatever being protected by the media, you couldn't do that now. There's no difference with the amount of drug use and negativity in the NFL compared to back then because, again, it was a swinging 70s. There was a lot of, a lot of shit going on. But the movie itself, like I said, when we were seeing the movie, it was all football fans pretty well at the movie. Very few, very few hockey fans would get this movie. You had to really be a follower of it. And like Sport Magazine, Sports Illustrated, ever since uh, Hail Mary and, you know, that 76 Super Bowl, we were learning uh, about these athletes as, as entertainers. Like O.J. Simpson was pretty well the first. Like, by the way, there was a whole generation grew up with O.J. Simpson as a superstar, not as a murderer. So, I mean, we're looking at NFL players, again, Lynn Swan, Stalwart, uh, Fran Tarkington, um, Joe Namath, they were entertainers. Football players yet, but we're doing commercials. I mean, Roger Staubach, I mean, uh, come on. 
he was asking asking about uh, how come you're always promiscuous. He goes, Joel name it. He said, I, I like sex like the next man, but I like it with only one girl. So, I mean, you wouldn't really say that in 2023, but back then it was kind of what he called the pre-VCR generation. But the movie itself works in a lot of ways. It's been shown on Hollywood Suite in Canada the last few days. It has an age well in places because, frig, this is 44 years ago, eh? It's almost like uh, that, uh, like a slap shot is a little bit of aspect of slap shot still in the modern day, you know, like the, the lure of senior hockey, and, you know, and riding the rails and the old, you know, uh, system. But my God, ladies and gentlemen, when this came out, we couldn't believe that Nick Nolte would ever have a $30 million movie because you're just like Gary Busey. He's, he's <laughs> how can I say this gently? Uh, women didn't like it and men, men found him irritating. So for him to make a $30 million movie, I mean, you can make, it's like making shit out of uh, making gold out of shit, like that famous uh, movie. There, the guy was uh, had the eye. He was he was shitting, but it was turning to gold, turning shit into solid gold, like the song says uh, at Radio Shack. So, if you have a chance to see it, the, down the Blu-ray, I think has some documentaries uh, on it. And for a comparable thing, uh, the recent Oliver Stone football—not recent, but the football movie Any Given Sunday—is a is a is a good match to watch. North Dallas Forty. And even everything given Sunday, because there is some slight uh, parallels in both movies. And I would give it three stars out of four, and I tell you why. Just to see the last of the 1970s NFL and CFL in the movie, it was very, very topical, and it still remains topical. This would be comparable to doing a Wayne Gretzky kind of themed hockey movie in 1985 with all like uh, Coffee and Lowe and Messier. And, and, and Guy Lafleur and kind of all the stars at the time, uh, Marcel Dion and that in the same movie. Because you saw the Raiders, you saw the, saw the Alouettes, you saw the Cowboys, you saw the 49ers, you saw the Colts, the Christian aspect of the NFL merging with the hedonistic aspect. And uh, the only thing it didn't touch on was steroid use. Uh, take it as, uh, as can be. So ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you're doing with our vintage 1970 movie uh, reviews and podcasts, let us know with a like, comment, subscribe, or share. Uh, we'd like to thank everybody. We just passed uh, 1,040,000 hits in the channel with close to 2,100 subscribers. This is your channel. If you have a request, don't forget they're greatly, greatly appreciated and greatly, greatly considered. Uh, we don't go for cheap hits here. We want to keep the history of movies, TV, sports, pop culture alive. And for the people that uh, are just recent to the channel, don't forget we have search archives we have between two and three thousand different podcasts over the last four or five years most five to fifteen minutes in length we rarely do a 20 minute podcast but this is kind of talking different stuff by the way if anybody's a fan of fred blitnikoff what do you think about nick nolte's impersonation of him in the movie thanks for listening bye